Thank you very much. I just want to give a special thank you to the Elements for their beautiful music tonight. Michael Bashaw, Sandy Bashaw, Rich Good, and Sharon Lee. And Michael's not only a performer, he's also the artist who designed and created the Dayton Literary Peace Prize sculptures. So, congratulations. Good evening, I'm Gilbert King. I can't tell you how nice it is to be back up here on this stage again. Tonight, we're here to celebrate, once again, a group of writers who will be awarded their Dayton Literary Peace Prize. As many of you know, my book, Devil in the Grove, was runner-up for nonfiction in 2013, and I've been coming back to Dayton ever since. Yeah. <laughs> Happily. As I stand up here, looking out at so many folks from the Dayton community I've come to love like family, I'm constantly reminded of the power and the importance of storytelling and literature, which is the beating heart of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. I can remember being here my first time listening to the impassioned acceptance speeches of my fellow authors and thinking to myself, this is the work I want to be doing. These are the people I want to be around. Brian Stevenson, Marilyn Robinson, Andrew Solomon, my new bestie, Margaret Atwood, and everyone who comes here every year and supports this. These are the writers who not only tell stories, their work has the power to affect both hearts and minds. They make the world we live in a better place. I got a small taste of that a few years ago when some Democratic state legislators in Florida decided to read Devil in the Grove in their book club. A few of them were outraged by the gross injustices and racial terrorism they learned about in their own state and they decided to try to do something about it. They co-sponsored a claims bill calling for the pardons of four wrongly accused African-American men who came to be known as the Groveland Four. And then a funny thing happened. The Republicans had their own book club, and they too read Devil in the Grove. And a few of those Republicans challenged their Democratic colleagues to a contest to see who could get more co-sponsors for this bill. And so in 2019, I showed up in Tallahassee and sat in the balcony with the families of the Groveland Four and watched as they tallied the votes for the claims bill. It was unanimous. All 117 state legislators, legislators turned to the families and with their hands on their hearts, they apologized on behalf of the state of Florida and recommended that the governor sign posthumous pardons. The Florida Senate followed with their own unanimous vote, 36 to nothing, to pass the bill. And one year later, I had the honor of testifying before the Florida Clemency Board, where Governor Ron DeSantis and his cabinet voted unanimously to pardon the Groveland Four. But it wasn't over. The families told me that a pardon wasn't enough. The guilty can be pardoned, they said, and their fathers and uncles were innocent. They wanted full exonerations. And so the push began, and so did the political momentum. The Florida Attorney Gen General reopened the case. They asked for all my case files and turned everything over to the state attorney in a very rural, conservative Lake County, Florida, where this take case took place. He was outraged after reading my book, he told me, and he had the power to do something about it. He talked to the families of the victims. Together we shared information and drove around in his truck to search for long lost physical evidence I had spent years looking for. He found it, a moldy decayed box from 1949 buried in a forgotten storage facility that could be tested using much more sophisticated DNA technology. Two weeks ago, this state attorney wrote a powerful motion he was aware of the forceful language of Thurgood Marshall, who represented the Groveland Four, and of Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, who wrote blisteringly of this case and, the and this injustice in the Jim Crow South. Language mattered to this state attorney. The Groveland families mattered. As Brian Stevenson would say, he got proximate to the suffering and the marginalized. In his motion's conclusion, this state attorney wrote, quote, 
Even a casual review of the record reveals that these four men were deprived of the fundamental due process rights that are afforded to all Americans. The evidence strongly suggests that a sheriff, a judge, and prosecutor all but guaranteed guilty verdicts in this case. These officials, disguised as keepers of the peace and masquerading as ministers of justice, disregarded their oaths and set in motion a series of events that forever destroyed these men, their families, and the community. I have not witnessed a more complete breakdown of the criminal justice system. This motion was filed in court two weeks ago, and I wanted this Dayton community, this Dayton family of mine, to be among the first to know that next Monday morning in the Lake County Courthouse, the Groveland Four will have all charges against them formally dismissed. After 72 long years, these families will finally have justice. Tonight, you're going to hear from so many gifted authors who have spent years of their lives researching and writing stories that can change hearts and minds, literature that can make the world a slightly better place to live. And with that, let's start the celebration by hearing from the founder of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, Sharon Rabb. Thank you again for coming. On behalf of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Foundation Board, the Advisory Council, our first time full-time Executive Director Nick Raines, and the dozens and dozens of volunteers who have spent two years making this evening and last evening a reality. In, via in fact, the events of the throughout this whole year a reality. We welcome you. This award is made up of a community of readers and writers working for peace, and that includes everyone in this auditorium. Without you, the awards would not be possible, and that is the truth. And we are grateful for and depend upon your generosity. We extend Dayton's hopes for peace nationally and internationally. As this first map shows, this year's winners bring our total number of winning writers to 84, and that doesn't include the finalists. Those writers come from 24 countries of origin. In the next map, you will see the settings for our winning and runner-up books now cover 61 countries. Dayton's identity is connected with peace around the world, and these books connect us more intimately with that world. During the COVID years, the scope of our lives shrank to the size of our homes. Televisions, computers, phones, glass rep rectangles of various sizes became our links to the outside world. With the exception of waving to a, a masked neighbor while walking the dog, or standing six feet behind a masked acquaintance at the grocery store, FaceTime and Zoom meetings with colleagues, friends, and family became the norm. We further isolated ourselves by class, by ideology, by limiting our variations of truth to those we agree with. Our escape from our cubbies, self-imposed and real, came through stories. Stories on television and stories in books could transport us out of our ever-shrinking world and allow us to open the door to ideas and people and places that we could not visit except through words and images. Alice Hoffman used fairy tales to describe the horror of the Holocaust, while Ariana Neumann slowly unfolded her father's own devastating version of the story for us. Al Alexander Starrett tells the story from the other side. Wen Fan Kwamai also gave us the missing voice of the other side, the voice of the North Vietnamese woman, telling the story of the war that destroyed our country and hers. 
Christy Lefteri and Jordan Ritter Khan captured for us the plight of the Syrian refugee in fiction and in nonfiction, a story made even more horrific by the report in the New York Times this morning of two U.S. bombs dropped in Syria in 2019, killing 70 civilians. Jennifer Eberhardt allowed us to travel deep inside ourselves to explore and possibly alter the core of our biases. Chanel Miller used her own story to unveil the systems that can further damage the already vulnerable. Margaret Atwood kaleidoscopes the past into the future to reveal the truth of the present as both a warning and a hope. We thank them each for transporting us outside ourselves into the realm of the uncomfortable and bring us back home again, changed, enlightened, more aware of ourselves and of the world. When you think about it, once a story is told, it is much a part of the listener as it is the teller. Once a story is read, a reader owns it, or at least their version of it, puts, it, puts the book on a shelf or on a nightstand, perhaps gives it to a friend, or recommends it to a book club, saying, you should read this. Sometimes more urgently, you must read this. The message being, I want to share this story with you because it changed me. In our case, and by our, I mean everyone in this auditorium, we have joined in passing these winning books and all of these books that have been nominated over the last two years that are in front of you. We share these with the world. Dayton is saying to the world, here, read this. It helped us find truth. Perhaps these books will enlighten you, create a connection with another person or another culture. Sharing these books is a sign of our hope for peace. So we thank these writers with us tonight for creations that teach us how to cope in a time when coping seems impossible. Writers who show us a path to peace. If we were seated at our ta tables on the stage, as we usually are, I would ask you to join me in three short toasts, but I'll give them now. To the world we dream of, to the world that can be, to the writers who guide us there. Thank you. Such a beautiful writer. Ron Rollins recently retired as a senior editor of Dayton Daily News, where he worked for more than 30 years. He was a longtime arts columnist and edited several books about Dayton history for the newspaper and taught journalism at Miami and Wright State Universities. He has led the boards of several local nonprofits involved with social services and the arts here, and currently runs the monthly Dayton Literary Peace Prize book group, which under his leadership has grown to over 50 people from throughout Ohio and reaching members from Rhode Island, New York, and Maryland. An avid reader, he is a key supporter of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize and has earned perfect attendance. Ron will introduce the 2020 and 2021 nonfiction runner-ups, Jennifer Eberhardt for Biased, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice that Shapes What We See, Think, and Do, and Jordan Ritter Khan, author of The Road from Raqqa, a story of brotherhood, borders, and belonging. Ron? I can't tell you how happy I am to be here tonight and see you all. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt, the non-fiction runner-up for Biased, uncovering the hidden prejudice that shapes what we see, think, and do. She is a professor of psychology at Stanford and a recipient of a 2014 MacArthur Genius Grant. She has been elected by, to the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and was named one of Foreign Policy's 100 Leading Global Thinkers. She is co-founder and director of SPARC, 
a Stanford center that brings together researchers and practitioners to address significant social problems. Bias impacts and describes and examines any of a hundred decisions that each of us make every day, whether we even realize we're making them or not, often poisoning our ability to make informed decisions carefully or to evaluate threats rationally as we might want to. It asks important questions. Is bias inevitable? Is it something to which we are all vulnerable? How do we perceive race? How can we affect the ways that we react as people to those perceptions? Bias shows us that there is science behind those answers we seek, and that science can help us change and grow and evolve. This is one of those books that to read it can help make you a better person. Please welcome Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you to uh, Sharon, the judges, the sponsors, everyone who worked so hard to gather us together to celebrate the power of the written word to bring peace. When my son was in first grade, he asked me a question I will never forget. We were in the kitchen, just the two of us. It was around Thanksgiving, so I had a lot of cooking to do. And my son was sitting there at the table and he looks up at me and he says, Mommy, do you think people see black people in a different way from white people? And I said, well, why would you say that? And he says, well, well I don't know. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he says, I'm not sure, but I just feel like there's something different. And I said, well, give me an example. And so he thought about it, didn't take long. He came up with an example. He said, remember last week, we were at the grocery store. And I saw a black man come into the store. Now, this was in a white neighborhood. And he said, I noticed that people kind of stayed away from him a little bit. It was like he had a giant force field around him. And when he went to stand in line, his was the shortest line for the longest time. And I said to him, well, what do you think that means? And he said, I don't know. And he thought about it and thought about it. And he looks up at me and he says, I think it's fear. Imagine that. A child at that age, a first grader, stumbling on that word, that feeling that animates so much of our racial divide. Our children watch us. They look at how we move through the world to make sense of who we are and how we are regarded. Years later, this same son at 16 years old discovered that when people looked at him, they felt fear. Elevators are the worst, he told me. And that's because as the doors close, people are trapped in this tiny space with a stranger that they have been taught for their entire lives to associate with danger. So my son would sense their discomfort and he would try to smile to put them at ease, to calm their fears, to let them know that he was not a bad person. And when he spoke, he noticed that their bodies would relax, they would breathe easier. He sounded like one of them. I used to think that my son was a natural extrovert, like his father. And it was at that moment 
when I realized that my son's smile was not an invitation to would-be friends. It was a survival skill honed over thousands of elevator rides. His personality, who he was becoming, was being shaped by fear. Today, we are living in a moment of racial unrest. Yet before the protests sparked by the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others, before the national awakening to systemic racism, the Pew Research Center released a report which found that six in 10 Americans rated race relations in this country as generally bad. And a majority of Americans feared that things were getting worse. They feared we were slipping back in time. As a nation, we were already struggling to hang on. I began the journey of writing a book to speak to that struggle, to bring the science of bias to everyday people. James Baldwin once said, a journey is called that because you cannot know what you will do with what you find or what you find will do to you. In this book, I take everyday people on a journey and all along the way, I attempt to bring into view how racial bias operates in police departments and in courtrooms in parks and neighborhoods, in schools and workplaces. Readers meet Bernice Donald, who was one of a handful of black students to desegregate an all-white school, a high school in Olive Branch, Mississippi, in the 1950s. They meet Campbell, a white law student at the University of Virginia. He went to battle with white supremacists in 2017 when they came to Charlottesville to start a race war. They meet people and of, you know, women and, and, and uh, people of color in workplaces all over the world trying to gain entry, trying to make headway, trying to be seen. Bias can touch our lives in so many ways. But here's the thing, we are not doomed to be under its grip. We are all capable of bias, but we don't act on bias all the time. Instead, bias is triggered by the situations we find ourselves in and the narratives we have inherited. As researchers, we know a lot about what those triggers are. And when we understand the factors that trigger bias, it opens up a huge array of interventions to mitigate it. About 20 years ago, I met a man on an airplane. He was white and from South Africa. We began talking and he told me all about his life. Now, at that point in my life, I'd never met anybody who was white and from South Africa, so I had a lot of questions to ask, including questions about apartheid. And I will never forget what he told me. He looked at me and he said, I didn't even know what apartheid was growing up. And I said, what? Well, you grew up in South Africa. How did you not notice the racial unrest? How did you not notice forced segregation. And he said that he understood that black people were poor and segregated, but he did not understand it as a system of apartheid because those in power did not have access to the language to describe it. That word apartheid never appeared on television. It never appeared in the newspaper. No one he knew ever spoke of it. Years later, I can finally comprehend what he meant. The U.S. is in a racial reckoning. Everything is being reassessed. Everything is being reexamined. 
There are new terms, there's new language to help people to see things that have been in front of them for their entire lives but were hard to see because they had no words for it. That conversation so long ago on that airplane is now leading me to wonder, what else don't we see in our own society? What else do we accept without question? And how can we move toward a peace that is tied to justice? I feel honored to be in the presence of giants this evening, authors who use the power of the written word to not only enlighten, but to light a path. People who provide us with the courage to face our fears so that we don't slip back in time, so that we continue to strive to see one another, so that we continue to strive to see ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Everhard. Jordan Ritter Kahn is the 2021 nonfiction runner up for his novel, The Road from Raqqa. Jordan is a staff writer for The Ringer, who previously worked at Grantland and ESPN the magazine, and he has written for the New York Times and Sports Illustrated. He is a two time finalist for the Livingston Award, and his work has been cited or recognized by The New Yorker. The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and Slate. In this suspenseful work of, in this suspenseful work of narrative nonfiction, Jordan takes us right into the middle of the Syrian civil war through the story of two brothers from a distinguished family from the city of Raqqa. Riyadh and Bashar al-Qassam live very different lives, yet through them and the way you meet them and hear their tales, Jordan shows the close in and far away impact of war. You realize very soon that you don't have to live in a war zone to have your life changed by it. Jordan's reporting is stunningly detailed. As a journalist, I would have loved to have sat in on some of these interviews. His storytelling is rich and vivid and his empathy runs very, very deep. Please welcome Jordan Ritter Khan. Thank you so much. Um, it's such an incredible honor to be here and I'm so, so deeply grateful to the organizers and, and the judges and uh, the, the other authors and all of you for, for being here. You know, I think if you ask most any writer about their work, we can all point to people besides ourselves without whom that work wouldn't exist. But I think that's especially true for writers who do the kind of work that I do, narrative journalism. Basically, my job is to tell other people's stories. And so to do that job, I, I have to encounter people with amazing and compelling stories, sure, but also people with the courage and vulnerability to let me in and to then trust um, a, an audience of readers to uh, give, give them access to some of their innermost thoughts and fears and experiences. And so to find people like this, narrative journalists like myself often have to get really, really lucky. I got really, really lucky one day in early 2016, and I told a bit of this story on the panel last night, so just to recap it, uh, I'd, I'd been reporting along the Syria-Turkey border and, and returned home to, to my home in Nashville and, and needed a translator and was told to drive out to this uh, this restaurant in a nearby town and introduce myself to the chef, a restaurant named Cafe Raka. And when I did so, I talked to the chef and he helped me out and, and we, we called my source and did the interview. And then afterwards, and this is something I neglected to mention last night, but should absolutely mention right now, 
he brought me a plate of hummus that I could have then and could still right now bathe in, <laughs> and another plate of lamb shawarma uh, piled on top of rice that just felt like a mountain in front of me. And we sat together and he watched me eat it, uh, which I did gladly. Um, and while I ate it, he, he told me his story. And he also told me the story of his city, of Raqqa. That story begins more than 200 years ago. In the 18th century, in the northeastern, uh, northeastern desert of what we now call Syria, there was a man named Ibrahim. And Ibrahim was a gifted warrior. Uh, he led armies on horseback and on camel to fight on behalf of the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottomans appreciated this and they rewarded him with a gift. Um, this was a piece of land that was tucked around a bend in the Euphrates River. But Ibrahim didn't really care much for the land. He just wanted to roam and to fight. And so he left it alone and continued to lead battle. And then Ibrahim had a son named Isa, who had a son named Hamid. But like Ibrahim, they were both warriors and they had no use for the land. And then Hamid had a son named Taha. And Taha didn't want to fight. And so when Taha inherited this land, he traveled there and he saw how beautiful it was, the, the green riverbanks giving way to the deserts, and he decided to stay. And the way this story goes, the, this story that, that Riyadh and his siblings and so many others grew up hearing as children in Raqqa, on Taha's first day there, he set up a tent and he made coffee. And the wind came off the river and carried the scent of the coffee across the desert. And soon other tribes smelled it. And members of those tribes took the scent as an invitation. And so they traveled and they met Taha. And Taha asked them to stay, to build a community there, a community that became a city. Time passed. Generations passed. And eventually, there in that city called Raqqa, Riyadh, my new friend from the restaurant with the hummus in Tennessee, was born. He was a direct descendant of Taha. And then soon after him, his younger brother Bashar was born. This book is the story of Riyadh and Bashar and their families. It's the story of Riyadh's journey to the United States as a young man where he became a citizen. And it's the story of Bashar staying in Raqqa only to watch his city crumble in the midst of serious civil war. It's a story of the ways life pulls these brothers apart and pushes them back together over decades, uh, culminating in a terrifying journey they take together as Riyadh tries to convince Bashar to flee his country as it descends deeper into war. It's quite something standing here on a night when we're discussing peace when so much of that story chronicles the impact of a war that is still ongoing today. And again, Narrative journalists like me are so deeply, deeply dependent on the vulnerability and the courage of the people who share their stories with us. And so before coming here this week, I, I took that drive out to Hendersonville, as, as I do a lot, and I saw Riyadh, and again, over some hummus, and I believe it was a wrap, a chicken wrap this week that was also really, really good. I, I asked him what came to mind when considering he and Bashar's story and the idea of peace. And his mind first went back to his ancestors, to Ibrahim, who was given the land by the Ottomans, and to Taha, who decided not to fight, but to settle there on that land and to build a community with others. Taha chose peace, Riyadh said. But he added that when looking at Raqqa now, where so many people have been killed, and where so many homes, including Riyadh and Bashar's own, have been destroyed, it's sometimes difficult to see the fruits of that choice. In the story of Riyadh and Bashar al-Qasim, peace is found instead in these smaller, quiet moments. Peace is Riyadh showing up at his family home, with the war raging all around him, and taking the time to sit at his mother's table to eat a breakfast she, prepare for, she prepared for him for the first time in many years, and to feel for a brief moment an American traveling back to his now war-ravaged country the way that he had as a little boy. Peace is Bashar taking his daughters outside their home on summer nights, setting out blankets so they could lie there and he could teach them about the stars, 
before the girls would drift off to sleep and he could wrap them up and carry them back inside to put them in bed before he knew the regime's bombs and later the American-led coalition's bombs would begin to fall. In their story, peace is found in their relationships and in their own spirits. It's found in the memory of their ancestors and it's found in their hopes for the future of their city that the legacy of its founding will be honored again. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, Ron, and Jennifer. That was, I knew we were going to hear some powerful stuff. We started out right away. Susan Southard is a devoted supporter of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. She's been a winner, a presenter, a featured Dayton Literary Peace Prize author series writer, and a nonfiction judge. We truly treasure our relationship with her. Susan's first book, Nagasaki, Life After a Nuclear War, received the 2016 Dayton Literary Peace Prize and the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize, sponsored by the Columbia School of Journalism and Harvard University's Neiman Foundation for Journalism. Nagasaki was also named a Best Book of the Year by the Washington Post, The Economist, Kirkus Reviews, and the American Library Association, and has been translated and published in countries around the world. Susan's work has also appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times, and Politico. Susan has spoken before the United Nations and continues to speak at international disarmament conferences, universities, and public forums across the United States and abroad. She's the founder and artistic director of the Phoenix-based Essential Theater, now in its 32nd season, serving marginalized communities across the Southwest and beyond. Susan will introduce 2020 and 2021 nonfiction winners, Chanel Miller, author of Know My Name, and Ariana Neumann, author of When Time Stopped, a memoir of my father's war and what remains. Susan. Good evening, everyone. Is that too close? Sounds loud. Oh, it's so wonderful to be here. Thank you to everyone. It's my great honor to introduce to you Chanel Miller, author of Know My Name, a stunning literary work that even now, as I stand here, brings me to tears because of Chanel's honesty, courage, insight, and totally gorgeous writing. It's a book about her rape, yes, and the trial of her attacker within our deeply flawed and dehumanizing judicial system. And Know My Name is about the traumas that come after the initial trauma, about being invisible, silenced, wrongly characterized, angry, terrified. It's about, in Chanel's words, the complexity of recovery and her struggle to emerge from hiding into a new life profoundly changed by her experiences. Know My Name is about disconnection and connection. Chanel's disconnection from her body after the rape, from, at varying levels, her family, friends, and co-workers, from most of the outside world during the trial, the media assaulting her character, the brazen, unfair, and inhumane words and actions by the defense team and others, her nervous system on constant overload, her life trapped in a hurricane of emotions. And Know My Name is about connection, most importantly, Chanel's gradual and grueling reconnection with herself, which ultimately led to a sense of deep connection with other survivors. I always wondered why survivors understood other survivors so well, she writes. Why, even if the details of our attacks vary, survivors can lock eyes and get it without having to explain. Perhaps it is not the particulars of the assault itself that we have in common, but the moment after, the first time you are left alone, something slipping out of you. Where did I go? What was taken? It is terror swallowed inside silence. An unclipping from the world where up was up and down was down. The moment is not pain, 
not hysteria, not crying. It's your insides turning to cold stones. It is utter confusion paired with knowing. Gone is the luxury of growing up slowly. So begins the brutal awakening. Know My Name reminds us of the horrific frequency, still, of sexual assault in this country and helps us understand that each individual's story is unique and often buried beneath complex layers of shame and fear. Chanel's truthfulness about her own experiences and her vivid, energized storytelling allows readers who have been sexually assaulted to feel recognized, understood, more visible. And for readers who are fortunate to never have been assaulted, they are able to understand far more than before. In this way, Know My Name is a beautiful and urgently needed act of generosity and compassion. Toward the end of the book, Chanel writes, victims exist in a society that tells us our purpose is to be an inspiring story. But sometimes, the best we can do is tell you we're still here, and that should be enough. Denying darkness does not bring anyone closer to the light. When you hear a story about rape, all the graphic and unsettling details, resist the instinct to turn away. Instead, look closer, because beneath the gore and the police reports is a whole beautiful person looking for ways to be in the world again. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled that Chanel is still here, inspiring us to not turn away, to see her and ourselves in new ways. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the 2020 winner of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize in nonfiction, Chanel Miller. Susan and what's up everybody. I want to first say thank you to the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Foundation for welcoming me. I want to thank first readers, judges, volunteers. I want to thank Sharon, Becca, and Nick for taking such good care of me so that I could enjoy this special evening. I think that is all my thank yous. I'm in awe also of my fellow authors. A common theme seems to be that we guzzle copious amounts of traumatic material and still look good and sound pretty good, so that's a miracle. I started writing my book when I was 24, and to be honest, my partial wish was that when I wrote about it, I would rid myself of it. I wanted to be done, to move on, to have my 20s returned to me. The week my book came out in September 2019, I was treated to lunch to celebrate, and I was seated across the table from Anita Hill and Gloria Steinem, which was basically like dining in heaven. <laughs> After lunch, when everyone was gone, I went back and I stole Anita Hill and Gloria Steinem's place cards that had their names written on them in beautiful calligraphy. The two place cards now live on my writing desk. I thought about why I had the impulse to take them and realized it's because that was the afternoon I stopped looking for the exit out of my story. That I understood I'm going to be in this for the long haul. But that doesn't have to be a daunting thing. Watching Gloria eat Arctic char with the sunlight pouring in, enjoying herself after all these decades of activism made me realize that down the line, I'm going to be okay. And if I do it right, one day I will be eating Arctic char sitting across from a young woman who's going to go home and journal about what I'm eating. <laughs> T 
Tonight, I was really banking on stealing Gloria's place card again. But I am happy to announce that I will try to steal something of Margaret's instead. <laughs> In the awards presentation booklets we were all given, I found a line Sharon Rabb wrote that I love. She said, we thank these authors for revealing their secrets so that we may be better, no, 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 let's begin again. We thank these authors for revealing their secrets so that we may better understand our own. Sharon is implying that all of you have secrets. And I like that. See, my dad is a retired therapist, and when I was young, my understanding was that he was a head doctor. Like if an adult had a headache, he was their Advil dealer. <laughs> I had no concept of mental health. It was only when I grew older that I realized adults present themselves as buttoned up, put together beings, when in actuality, they're prone to unraveling in private. This was a crucial revelation that we all have our shit, some are just better at hiding it. So when it came time to write my particular brand of shit, I did not hesitate. I know it is okay to say that I've been depressed, outraged, assaulted, because I'm the 400 gajillionth person on earth to have felt and been through these things. Which is why I find it so strange that survivors of sexual assault are still made to feel ashamed of themselves and their stories. They're the ones tasked with sparing us the graphic details, trimming the sharp edges to present tolerable versions, when really it is our job as a society to expand our capacity to receive their stories. The beauty of tonight is that that's what you all are doing signaling to me and other survivors who are watching that you are not only prepared to receive these stories, but celebrate them. I've always rejected the notion that survivors have our own sets of feelings. People always say to me, I can't imagine if they've never been a victim, but I think that's baloney. If you're a human being, I believe you have the ability to feel what I felt if you are simply willing to feel it. In the beginning, I hated everything that was happening to me. I didn't have the language for it. I felt suffocated by it. I could not conceive of a way out from under it. But I started to approach feelings the same way people approach bird watching or rock collecting. Instead of letting a feeling fester inside me, I would start to write in order to observe it. Note the size and shape and weight of it. Note how and when it inhabited me. Suddenly, each awful feeling became an exciting challenge, testing my ability to describe and capture an invisible thing. Take the feeling of frustration, for example. We all know what that word means, but if a little alien descended right now in a little spaceship and landed on this podium, how would you describe frustration? I can think of a memory. I'm skiing for the first time. I'm wearing thick waterproof mittens in a puffy snowsuit, and I'm on this big snowy mountain, and I have a wedgie. I'm glazing my mitten over my bum again and again, and I cannot grasp anything. My underwear is lodged too deeply. There's too much puffy material in between. It's not going to happen, and so my body fills with heat, and my eyes tear up because it's maddening, and I think, what is this? This is frustration. So, with this one story, the alien now knows the feeling. But the most important reason that I write is to compete. 
When I write, I show up to compete. Not with other authors, but with the voices I know that are coming to unleash hell on the next survivor. The brutal voices I encountered in the courtroom, online chat rooms, the ones that hurt me, the ones that I can still hear, the ones I continually have to overcome as to remind myself that I am a notable author and that even if I wasn't, I am still worthy of love and care. I know these harsh voices will find her, which is why I hope my book will find her faster. The better I write, the better chance I have that she is going to listen to me and not them. So I work. To make my voice strong, persuasive, honest, clear. On the panel yesterday, I learned a lot of us have trouble sleeping, that we are driven by people or stories we simply can't stop thinking about. And it's funny, we're here to speak of peace because inner turmoil seems to be abundant. But I do believe peace arrives in doses. It is earned in moments. Yesterday, Gilbert threw out a pretty loaded question about hope. Do we have it? I traveled to Amsterdam to promote my book. And while I was there, my team received a message from a male ballet dancer who was requesting to meet me. I thought, okay, this man is either a murderer or a real ballerina. So I went to go meet him and luckily he was the latter. He had choreographed a piece that opened with audio of my voice and cast a ballerina who represented justice while the other dancers resembled all the obstacles she encountered. There was so much push and pull, grace and turbulence embodied. It was beautiful. After showing me the video, he invited me to go eat soup, and then it began to pour. I remember sitting in the little restaurant, looking out the window, thinking, I am in Amsterdam, eating soup with a ballerina in the rain. The line sounds like fiction, Sounds like it does not belong in my story, but it does. This is what I keep finding, that reality keeps surpassing my dreams in the worst and most wonderful ways. If at any moment life can abruptly be altered, subject to catastrophic change, then it must also be true that at any moment life can introduce these unbelievable possibilities. My life still feels surreal to me, so I cannot help but hope. Given the details of my assault, I was nervous for a long time to come to Dayton, Ohio. I was tempted to stay at home, greet you safely from behind a screen. But I decided I wanted to give myself a chance to form my own memory of this place. So thank you to everyone at the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Foundation. Tonight, I stand looking out at all of you. And this is the image I will take. This is the memory you have now gifted me. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I have to gain my composure after that. <laughs> and I want to give Ariana her due, her huge due, so I'm just going to take a second. Oh my. <sighs> it's such a privilege, a profound privilege, to introduce Ariana Neumann 
and her book, When Time Stopped, a breathlessly beautiful portrait of Ariana's Czech father, Hans Neumann, and his family during the Holocaust, most of whom Ariana had never met or even heard spoken of by her father, who remained virtually silent throughout his life about everything he and his family had experienced. Forged by a huge amount of research on at least three continents, translation of letters, diaries, and personal and archival documents, and countless interviews and conversations with extended family members, their children, and family friends, when st time stopped is a work of profound love, ultimately opening Ariana and us, her readers, to a rich and deeply humane understanding of who her father was and why, and the very personal impact of the Holocaust's terrors on those who survived and those who didn't. When Time Stopped had, excuse me, When Time Stopped has multiple parallel narratives woven into a seamless whole, including Ariana's childhood in Venezuela, the process of her tenacious research to understand her father's uh, and his family's experiences in Czechoslovakia during the war, and Ariana's very intimate reconstruction of their lives and the larger history and context of their experiences before, during, and after the German occupation and deportation of Jews from their country. Ariana has broken her father's silence to bring him to life as a young man, along with his parents, Otto and Ella, and his older brother, Lothar, and their extended family and beloved friends. Their love for one another is remarkable. At a time in their city of constant dehumanization by the Nazis and moment-to-moment -moment terror of being arrested, tortured, or shot, Hans, for years, Hans and his family held on to their humanity making daring and extreme choices in order to survive and nearly beyond imagination, risking their lives over and over and over again to take care of themselves and each other. As she researched and wrote this book, their stories became Ariana's. And ultimately, because of Ariana's dedication and masterful writing, there, they become our stories as well. Theirs become our stories as well. I came to love each member of Ariana's family. I didn't want the book to end. When Time Stopped is transformative, a literary work that brings more peace into our denying and divided world. Please join me wholeheartedly in congratulating and welcoming to the stage our 2021 D Dayton Literary Peace Prize winner in nonfiction, Ariana Neumann. Thank you so much, Susan, for those beautiful words, which were way too kind, but thank you. And uh, thank you, Sharon, for creating and, and just for this special, meaningful event. Um, it's quite incredible to be here. Um, I'm an imposter, really. It shouldn't be me standing on the stage. You see, this all started because a little girl detective wanted to solve the mystery of her father. I grew up in the Venezuela of the 70s and 80s, a magical place filled with light, then hailed as a model of peaceful democracy. It is very different now, but that's another speech. Then, it was full of promise. My father emigrated to Caracas in, from Czechoslovakia in 1949, and by the time I came along, he was a successful industrialist, a Renaissance man, with a hand in everything, art, industry, media, education, you name it. He had married my gorgeous, much younger mother, who came from a traditional Venezuelan family and who worked in ballet and theater. So I grew up surrounded by art, by beauty, by people discussing ideas, by the prattle of happiness. And yet, 
even there, thousands of miles away, decades after World War II, you could still sense something in the silences, in the shadows, something horrifying that made my father wake up in the night screaming in a language that I didn't understand. I knew nothing of my father's life before Venezuela. The past was never discussed. But I wasn't conscious then of this absence of stories. You see, his present was so vivid that it seemed only normal that the past was never in focus. And then on my mother's side, I had this vast, boisterous, passionate family straight out of Garcia Marquez. Every party must include every relation, even the fourth cousins twice removed, or there would be a big drama. But on my father's side, there was quiet. I knew only that he had escaped a broken Europe with his brother. When I asked about my grandparents as a child, I was given only names, Otto, Ella, no details. So within the silence lay mysteries, and as a young girl, I was desperate to solve them. And who solves mysteries? Detectives. So that is what I determined to become. The trouble you see is I was nine. I figured the enterprise would be a little scary, but mostly exciting and triumphant. Like the Encyclopedia Brown books that I was reading, which of course I assumed at the time were completely nonfiction. But one afternoon, that nine-year-old detective found a box containing an ID card. It was marked Berlin, 1943. The young man in the photo was my father. I knew that. His large, deep-set eyes were unmistakable. But my father came from Prague, not Berlin. And most terrifying of all was that the name wasn't his. So I ran that afternoon to my mother, screaming that she was married to an imposter. Some detective I was. I was told not to ask questions because they upset my father. And it wasn't until 2001, after my father had died, that I saw that ID again. He had thrown away all his files, but left this to me in the same box. And in that box, now or then, were documents from his two years, dozens of documents from his two years in Berlin, hiding in plain sight under a false identity while working in a Nazi factory. Finding that box again summoned the kid detective. But I knew we weren't talking about the pleasing mysteries I had dreamed of solving as a child. And I had a million reasons to leave that box closed. It was the wrong time in my life. I was, my eldest was actually born three weeks after my father died. I was starting a family. I was full of optimism. I had to warm bottles. I had to read the Gruffalo, not plunge into a dark past. A past that must have been truly horrific if my courageous, larger-than-life father had chose to leave it untold. So eventually I stopped reading the Gruffalo. My kids actually started reading their own bedtime stories and curiosity once again took over. A sense of duty took over. I started asking questions, searching archives, tracing people all over the world, and more boxes appeared, including one precious one containing dozens, dozens of uncensored letters from my grandparents, letters that had been smuggled out of the camp of Theresienstadt. I assumed those letters would be filled with despair, and they terrified me. And yet, they were the only window I had from which to see who these people, who my family, were. The translations, of course, arrived digitally, and I only pressed print to make them more real. A computer file is intangible, so very easy to ignore. And I couldn't do that. Sometimes at the beginning, alone, I'd sit in this beautiful, light-filled room in my home in London, the one I share with my very patient husband, my lunatic teenage kids, and my three dogs. And I'd open the drawer, and I'd read a few lines. 
and often I was so overcome by tears so quickly I'd have to stop. My mother, who was even then still trying to protect me, kept asking me why I was delving into a past when I had such a happy life. And she was right. My little bubble was wonderful. But around me, not just in Venezuela, but in the UK, in Europe, in Asia, here in the US, we were erecting walls, real, metaphoric. We were brutally focusing on what separates us. And I sensed echoes of what must have happened to my family in the 30s. So I persevered. In my research, I did find stories of dehumanization and horrendous cruelty. And I learned how insidious racism is, how it permeates everyday life, how language and laws can be its teeth. Laws that taken individually seem so petty, they were hard to stand up against. And yet, when taken together, were completely crushing. But I also found stories of humanity and kindness, of beauty, of hope. Glimmers of light in those terrifying letters. My grandfather singing on his way to work in Theresienstadt. My grandmother describing the beauty of the spring flowers that grew even in that camp and that allowed her to dream of happier times. And then there were the people I found my God, the people, the fabulous man who built a fake wall to hide my father, despite the protestations of his terrified wife. My father's amazing friends who gave him papers to cross into Berlin from Prague on the midnight train on the 3rd of May, 1943. The beautiful, brave woman who snuck into the camp to bring food and supplies and hope to my grandparents. They all could have turned away, and yet they risked their lives over and over and over again. And these people lit my way forward. They showed me that there are no heroes. There are just people like us, like you, like me, who choose to carry out heroic acts. People who choose the right thing, who choose humanity and love empathy, understanding, who choose to value what binds us, what makes us all the same. Amanda Gorman said in her stunning poem at the inauguration that we must be brave enough to be the light. And those people around my family were just that. So I'm happy to report that it's taken her almost 40 years, but the child detective has solved the mystery of her dad. I found family I didn't know I had, and I'm now friends with the children of those friends who helped my family survive as long as they could. So I now tell their stories. I do so because it is my duty, but also because humanizing my family feels like my own little act of rebellion. Humanizing does, after all, the opposite of what war does. It effaces hatred and fear. Peace is understanding. It is what binds us through arbitrary constructs of culture and race so that we feel a sense of community with those that could see mother. There were 34 people in my father's family, their ages ranging from 8 to 66 at the start of the war. 25 were murdered. So I tell their stories which are illuminated by hope and the promise of peace. I tell them not to recall the horrors, although we must, but to celebrate the light and to remember just one crazy, boisterous family that was silenced. Those that were dehumanized and reduced to ashes have become part of my everyday. They are real. They're fabulous, they're flawed, and they're full of life. If you will allow me a little magic, magical realism, I am, after all, half Venezuelan. I'll share with you today that they're here. Please indulge me as I call their names, but be under no illusion. 
they are already with me. I told you I was an imposter. I'm just a storyteller. This award, it's all theirs. Otto and Ella and Rudolf and Jenny and Carol and Joseph and Hilda and Oscar and Yolana and Moritz and Arno and Otta and Hermina and Hannah and Richard and Hugo and Marta and Julius and Emma and Rudolf and Josepha and Vera and Eva and Milan and Jerry. This is theirs. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the 2020 winners of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Um, we're going to start out with the um, fiction portion of the evening. Then we'll obviously move to nonfiction and the Richard Holbrook Achievement Award. I am going to start out by introducing to you Moriel Rothman Zecker. Moriel Rothman Zecker is a Dayton Literary Peace Prize finalist for his novel Sadness is a White Bird. In addition, Morel received the National Book Foundation's 5 Under 35 honor. He's the winner of the Ohioana Book Award, a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award, winner of the Cincinnati Books by the Banks Order, Author Award, and long-listed for the Center for Fiction's first novel prize. His essays and poems have been published in the New York Times, Hearts, the Paris Reviews Daily, and elsewhere. His second novel is forthcoming from Farrar Strauss Giroux. Moriel was born in Jerusalem and lives in Yellow Springs, Ohio with his family. Moriel will be introducing the 2020 fiction runner-up Christy Leftieri for The Beekeeper of Aleppo and the 2021 fiction runner-up K. Mai Guyen for The Mountain Sing. K I'm sorry, K. Mai Wen. Uh, Moriel, are you here? I hope so. There you are. <laughs> According to the French Jewish philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, the other manifests itself by the absolute resistance of its defenseless eye. The infinite in the face brings into question my freedom, which is discovered to be murderous and usurpatory. And the eye is indeed defenseless. It is the only part of our interior body constantly exposed to the outside world. No skin or nails to protect it. Fragile, vulnerable, exposed. Levinas argues that when we truly look into someone's eyes, we come face to face with our capacity to murder them. This is why I think many of us so rarely look into one another's eyes. To discover our freedom to be murderous and usurpatory is a frightening thing indeed. Christy Lefteri's novel, The Beekeeper of Aleppo, begins precisely on this note. On the note of eyes and the staggering fear they can conjure in us, the first line of the book is as follows. I am scared of my wife's eyes. This line, like the rest of the novel, is the interior voice of a man named, named Nuri Ibrahim, a beekeeper from Aleppo, Syria. As the book opens, Nuri and his wife, Afra, are seeking asylum in the United Kingdom, and as the book unfolds, we encounter more and more pieces of the terrifying journey through Turkey and Greece that brought them there, and of the excruciating horrors and traumas from back in Syria, where Nuri and his elder cousin Mustafa had once been beekeepers. Afra had been a painter. Now their lives have been shattered, their beloved son killed, and they are both struggling to continue living in the wake of this unthinkable catastrophe. Nuri writes to his cousin, Mustafa, I believe I am unwell. I have no dreams left. Throughout this book, as he reflects on the place in which he has arrived and the horrors he has passed through, Nuri thinks constantly of eyes. His wife, Afra, we discovered at the start of the book, has recently been blinded. She can't see out and no one can see in, Nuri thinks. When recalling how, his hurt, how he hurt his father by refusing to take over his shop, 
Nuri recalls the pain in his eyes. When listening to the story of a Moroccan man also seeking asylum, Nuri notices his eyes shimmering and when remembering how his son, Sami, died. Nuri thinks repeatedly of Sami's eyes, of the light fading from them. In his reflections, on the power of eyes, Levinas asserts that it is only through truly looking into the other's eyes, through encountering our own usurpatory freedom, our own capacity to murder, it is only through this that we can choose to put a limitation on our own freedom. We may choose actively not to murder the other, and in so doing, we may love them, not tritely, but truly. In Lefteri's book, she asks the reader to look into the eyes of these characters, Nuri and Afra, fictional though they might be. She is asking us as readers to contemplate our own freedom and to realize the ways in which it is murderous and usurpatory, precisely because of how this freedom allows us to look away, to fail to see. The Syrian refugee crisis, which is at the heart of this book, remains the largest refugee crisis in the world. There are almost seven million Syrian refugees and asylum seekers, and almost seven million more displaced within Syria. Is there anything we can do to ameliorate the suffering that has been and continues to be wrought? That is an important question and a difficult one. But is anyone going to hold us accountable to doing so? Absolutely not. We are free, we are free. Our freedom, we discover when looking into the eyes of Lefteri's characters, is murderous and usurpatory, but we are free. In the author's note to the book, Lefteri writes about moments of love she encountered volunteering in the refugee camps, the way that love allows the characters to start to make a journey toward survival and renewal. I think Levinas and Lefteri are right. The choice we face is one between murderousness and love, and a way to encounter this choice, to see, is to see and to truly look into one another's eyes. This is what Lefteri, I think, has done in writing this novel, and this is what she is inviting us as readers to do as well. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Christy Lefteri, the 2020 fiction runner-up for her novel, The Beekeeper of Aleppo. Chris Lefteri, the author of The Beekeeper of Aleppo. I'm so sorry that I couldn't be there in person. I'm actually pregnant due in January and it's difficult for me to travel at the moment, but I'm very happy that I can join you virtually at least. I've actually tried to record this video about 20 times and my boyfriend is starting to get annoyed with me because I keep laughing. So if I laugh this time, I'm just going to flow with it and go with it. Um, I, I wanted to say that I feel absolutely honoured to have been chosen as the runner-up of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize 2020, particularly as it's such a special award, an award that recognises the power of the written word to promote peace, celebrating and acknowledging the force that literature can have in society. For an award like this to be offered to me is something that I will treasure forever. Before I wrote Beekeeper, while I was volunteering as a, um, in a refugee centre in Athens, I remember being completely overwhelmed with emotion, seeing children come to the centre, children who had lost so much, who did not have a safe place to call home, seeing also babies born as refugees, seeing trauma, fear, sadness, despair, but also hope and love in people's eyes. I will never forget that. I wrote Beekeeper out of a need, a need to write down in some way, to structure, to shape, the emotions and the knowledge and understanding that I had developed. My parents were also refugees, so this was something that was so close to my heart. I had grown up in the shadow of the war in Cyprus in 1974. It means the world to me that the story I wrote has had an effect on people, that it has elicited more communication and that people have been able to feel and walk with the characters. To be able to say that you have done something in your life which people believe has promoted peace is a very special thing indeed. I am so honoured to be the recipient of this award. It has touched my heart in more ways than I can even say. Thank you, thank you once more. I hope that you have a wonderful evening and a wonderful weekend and sorry again that I couldn't be there in person. Goodbye. Of the world. Being anti-war is like being anti-weather. War is the inevitable result of human nature, of history. 
These are the voices of the cynics, of the jaded, of the privileged, of the frightened. These voices do not belong exclusively to some group of others out there, perched somewhere outside these walls. Rather, I'd argue that there are versions of these voices at various intensities and at various intervals in many of us here in this room, if not in all of us. And these voices, these part of us, these parts of us, their first reaction is to recoil, to scoff, to hiss, to growl, to dissociate when faced with a voice that says loudly, clearly, lucidly, otherwise. With a voice that dares to challenge this accepted wisdom, which is, of course, also a hideous folly. Wien Fan Kwe Mai's novel, The Mountain Sing, is one of those rare, exhilarating works of art that cuts through layers and layers of cynicism and complacency with just a few well-wielded words. In the dedication to her novel, for members of her own family who were killed and tormented during the horrors of war and political crisis, and for the millions killed during the Vietnam War, Kwe Mai writes as follows, may our planet never see another armed conflict. Impossible, howls the cynic. It will, it has, it will again, shrieks the jaded. How dare she, cries the fearful voice in each of us. And then, hopefully, we ask these voices to be silent, and we turn the page to begin reading this stunning, masterful novel. The Mountain Sing tells the story of two women, Ziu Lan and her granddaughter, Hong, who is often qual called by her nickname, Guava. Respectively, these two live through half a century of Vietnam's history, through French and Japanese occupations, through the great hunger, through the brutalities of land reform, and through the horrors of the American imperialist war and its aftermath. And for all the pain, suffering, and loss experienced by these two women and their family, there is not a single cynical sentence in this entire novel. What this novel is filled with, however, is writing so beautiful and elegant that the American reader cannot help but think of Vladimir Nabokov, who, like Win Fan Kwe Mai, wrote in English as a second language and crafted sentences and lines that would make any native English writer writhe with jealousy, any native English reader gasp with wonder. In this book, two young lovers kiss under the speechless sky. Enemy soldiers are described bathing, dappled sunlight glimmered on their bodies, glittering on the stream surface. The air smelled fresh and happy. A mother trying to find her children reflects, there seemed to be thousands of ants biting my skin. We in Fan Kwe Mai has published eight previous books of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction to great acclaim in Vietnamese. The English-speaking world is fortunate that she has cho chosen to turn her poet's pen toward English for this novel, The Mountains Sing. This is an anti-war novel, and the hard-won answer to the sickness of war proposed by this book's narrator, Hung, is a simple, transformative act, namely, that of reading novels. I had resented America too, Hung reflects, but by reading their books, I saw the other side of them, their humanity. Somehow, I was sure that if people were willing to read each other and see the light of other cultures, there would be no war on Earth. I think this is a dangerous statement, a subversive sentiment, primarily because I, like Hung, think that it is true. How many companies would go bankrupt? How many politicians would lose their grips on power? How many ideologies would crumble into dust? This is a book that those with an investment of, in war should fear. But as Hung says in the book, following in the footsteps of the poet Fung Quan, if I wrote, it could only be the truth as I saw it. I couldn't twist my words to please the ears of those in power. And like her narrator, Wien Fan Kwe Mai has managed to write a novel brimming with this sort of truth as she sees it. And as I think many of us might come to see it too, if we are fortunate and brave enough to read this book, it is my immense and profound honor to introduce Wien Fan Kwe Mai, author of the novel, The Mountains Sing. Thank you so much, Maria, for such a thoughtful introduction. You are the 
ambassador of peace, and I'm so, so deeply honored. I found out tonight that uh, Moriel means um, God is my teacher. He has a beautiful uh, a, and a very rare name. And it is such a rare evening to be here in your presence today. Isn't it a glorious evening? <laughs> this weekend has been a dream for me. Um, I am so, so full of, um, I'm speechless, speechless, speechless at how wonderful the Dayton Literary Peace Prize Foundation is and how hard so many people have worked to put these events together, from, from the volunteers to Sharon and Nick, uh, to all the donors and all the supporters here. Thank you so much for all of your great support. Mm, I need to thank my earliest champion, my, my literary agent, Julie C Stevenson, who's, who flew many flights to be here with me tonight. She took big risk by championing my work because I write in a second language and I wrote the mountain sing with a dictionary. I also need to, uh, to thank Betsy uh, Gleick and the team at Algonquin Books who accepted my proposal that we publish Vietnamese language in, in full tonal marks. Because normally when Vietnamese language is published as part of the English text, it is stripped of the, uh, the, the tonal marks. So we need to please the eyes and ears of Western readers. So I wanted to decolonize literature about Vietnam and preserve the complexity and the beauty of the Vietnamese language. And I'm really grateful for, for you know, the respect that Betsy, my editor, and Algon Queen, my publisher, has for Vietnamese culture. So it's truly a dream that I'm here today in your presence to witness the unity of the Dayton community who have risen from the challenges of the pandemic to continue working together towards peace. It is a dream that I'm in a company of writers whose work has influenced me and helped me to become the writer I am today. As I stand here with you today, my thoughts are, many thoughts are running in my head. I'm thinking about my two uncles who fought on opposite sides of the Vietnam War against each other. One was killed in battle while his wife was pregnant with his baby daughter. Another one defeated death, but the war took away a part of his soul so he was never whole again. I'm thinking about the ma the ma a mother whose body I had seen dangling from a tree branch when I walked to school as a little girl. The mother had been waiting for the return of her two sons for more than 10 years. And when hope ran out, she decided to take her life. I'm thinking about the Trường Sơn Cemetery of Fallen Soldiers in Quảng Chi, the central region of Vietnam where rows and rows of graves marked with unknown soldier stretch before my eyes. I stood in silence next to a grave with two headstones bearing two names. Two mothers had believed the remains of the man under that grave belonged to her son. Hope was the only thing that kept them alive. I'm thinking about millions of Vietnamese, Laotians, and Cambodians who are still suffering from the impact of the deadly chemical Agent Orange, 19.5 million gallons of which the US military had sprayed onto Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia during the Vietnam War. I am thinking of babies who are still being born deformed because of the chemical. 
of a mother who had cried on my shoulder outside an orphanage because she could not take care of her deformed son. She had to give him up to the orphanage. Before that, her husband had died because of illnesses caused by Agent Orange. Her question still lives in me after all these years. Can you imagine how it feels to give up your own son because you, un you are unable to take care of him? As I am here with you today in this beautiful theater where peace and safety taste sweet on our tongues, I'm thinking about 800,000 tons of unexploded bombs and explosives still buried in the soil of my homeland, Vietnam. Left over by the Vietnam War, those bombs and explosives still kill innocent un children until today. And I'm thinking about the 2.5 million Americans who had to fight in our terrible war, many of whom lost their lives in Vietnam, and many died later due to suicides. Those who are lucky enough to survive are suffering from PTSD and trauma, as well as the devastating impact of Agent Orange. And I recall that when I was a small child, I stood on the dirt road of my village in Vietnam, looking at the devastation around me, as well as at the people who had lost their family members, or their arms, or their legs. And I asked myself as a small child, why can't humans love humans more? Haven't we done enough to each other? I have searched for the answers my ho to those questions all my life, and have, I have found out that humans have inflicted too much pain and far too many atrocities onto each other. And yes, we humans are capable of loving other humans. Unfortunately, Many of us live in our small world, surrounded by our own community and our own people. And without, literature, and without literature, we would fail to see people from different races, different religions or ethnic groups in their full human capacity. Without literature, we would believe in war propaganda such as these words from William Westmoreland, former commander of US forces in Vietnam, who said in a documentary, the Oriental doesn't put the same price on life as does a Westerner. Life is plentiful, life is cheap in the Orient. My novel, The Mountain Sing, show readers that life is precious for Vietnamese civilians as it is for Americans. And Vietnamese people, like Americans and any other nationality, love our families. We love to eat and sing and dance. More importantly, we are more than a war. We are a country full of hope, full of longing for peace, full of poetry. Literature is instrumental for us to build and sustain a world of peace. Literature humanizes those whom we might see as our enemy. It allows us to live the lives of others, experience other cultures, and empathize with those who are different than us. Literature allows us to see that we are all equal and complex, and no race is more superior. Literature brings people together, and if we read widely with empathy and compassion, we will see that there is no other, that human beings, regardless of our religion, race, nationality, are more alike. 
than different. By supporting the work of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, all of you are building the foundation for peace. By reading and supporting diversity in literature, you are peace ambassadors. I sincerely thank you for being part of this wonderful community. While I'm hopeful for a world of sustainable peace, I can see a long road ahead of us, filled with divisions, conflicts, and challenges. We have so much work to do, but in unity, we will find power, as per the Vietnamese proverb, một cây làm trắng nên non, ba cây chùm lại nên hòn núi cao. A single tree alone cannot form even a tiny hill, but three trees together rise into a high mountain. Two authors who have won the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, my warmest congratulations to you. May we work together to promote diversity in literature, to appreciate our differences, and to connect hearts and minds with our writing so that one day our world becomes one. Thank you. I think anybody who spent time with Kwe Mai this weekend knew she was going to do something like that. That was great. If you could only see where I'm sitting, you can see as we go through with the fiction portion of this program, the novelists all have notes and rewrites in the margins. It's like they never end. They're just doing it backstage. It's a phenomenal thing. I'm going to read from the citation written by the writer, literary professor, and fiction finalist judge, Diane Roberts. Alice Hoffman's novel is a dark, fierce fairy tale about a girl, a golem, and the power of love. Nazi-occupied Europe bred any number of monsters, but also heroes and good witches and ordinary people battling extraordinary evil. In the forests and villages of La France Profonde, farmers and doctors and old ladies hide Jews and help the resistance, gumming up Hitler's death machine, prepared to sacrifice themselves in the service of human decency. Hoffman does not shrink from describing the violence, the sheer viciousness of the Nazis, but her austerely lyrical prose ensures she never milks the horror for effect. She writes of the killing of innocents with a deceptive calm. Skip a couple of sentences and you might miss it. Hoffman treats the most terrible incidents the way Eudora Welty and the Brothers Grimm do, depicting rape and murder in almost matter-of-fact terms, as if reporting the passing of the seasons or the risings of the sun. Yet this plain presentation heightens the horror. The straightforwardness of Hoffman's language is like a bright light illuminating torn, illuminating torn and bloody flesh. Hoffman's novels often deploy a kind of magic realism in the face of trauma. The Newman is slipping delicate as a cat into the lives of people experiencing unimaginable cruelty. It's a strategy she's deployed before in novels such as The Museum of Extraordinary Things and Blackbird House, exquisitely and unobtrusively threaded into the fabric of her characters' lives. You're somehow not surprised that the dark-clad angel of death can be found lurking among the trees or that a young woman made of mud can converse with a heron. At a time when our world is again struggling with the hatred of those with a different faith, a different skin color, a different understanding of what patriotism means, this beautiful, pitiless book forces us to confront just how easy it can be to deny people their humanity in the name of protecting our own. Hoffman shows that the atrocities we visit on one another can be made to sound perfectly rational, quote, necessary to national security, or, quote, guarding us from that terrifying other, that threat lurking just outside the gates. As Hoffman puts it, quote, that was how evil spoke. It made its own corrupt sense. It swore that the good were evil and that the evil had come to save mankind. It brought up ancient fears and scattered them on the street like pearls. 
Alice Hoffman is the author of more than 30 works of fiction, including Magic Lessons, The World We Knew, Practical Magic, The Rules of Magic, Oprah Book Club Selection Here on Earth, The Red Garden, The Museum of Extraordinary Things, and Faithful. Hoffman's novels often deploy a kind of magical realism in the face of trauma. She lives near Boston, and it's my honor to introduce Alice Hoffman, the 2020 Dayton Literary Peace Prize winner for fiction. Alice, who's unable to be here, uh, but she's prepared this acceptance speech for us. Thank you. Hi, it's a great honor to be selected as the winner of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize for my novel, The World That We Knew, a book that explores what it means to be human in an inhuman time. Literature's greatest gift is that it allows readers and writers to imagine ourselves living other lives as other souls in situations that challenge who we are and allow us to think about living a moral life. In writing about the Holocaust and the world that we knew, I wanted to explore what it feels like to be abandoned and ostracized as the result of being considered an outsider. For me, novels begin in different ways, but they always begin with a question. And when I wrote The World That We Knew in 2016, I was looking for hope. The question I most needed answered was how do people survive in dark times? I still have that question in our world today. I've always been drawn to fairy tales, and I've come to understand that they are perhaps the most autobiographical of all stories, containing the deepest psychological truths and addressing our personal and collective fears. The idea of the world that we knew came into being completely by accident, although I now feel it was meant to be. I had given a reading at a library in Florida, and afterward I discovered that a woman was waiting for me in the parking lot. She introduced herself and immediately told me I needed to write her life story. I was apologetic. I told her I couldn't possibly do that. I had always been an escapist reader and I had become an escapist writer. My interest was fairy tales and folk tales and myth. I wanted to create new fictional worlds. But you must, the woman in the parking lot told me. Otherwise, people will forget. She revealed that she had been a hidden child in France during World War II. And although she was a Jew, she had been sent to a convent by her parents to be raised as a Catholic. Her parents' great sacrifice was the reason she had not been arrested by the French police or by the Gestapo. It was the reason she had survived. But would the story also survive? Or would people forget the cruelty of the time? That was her worry. Would people remember? I hadn't heard of hidden children in France before, and I was interested, but I had to leave. So I thanked her, and I didn't get her name or the details of her life. I didn't yet realize that the bare bones of her life story, the tale of a child separated from her parents, is the central motif of most fairy tales, reaching the most vulnerable parts of our hearts and souls. When you lose your child, the future vanishes. And when you lose your parent, the world ends. But once you tell a story, you are not forgotten. This is what our grandmothers wanted us to know, and this is what I realized while writing my novel. Fairy tales tell us that we may be lost and we may be forsaken, but there is a path. I began my journey by contacting my friend Jill Carp at Facing History and Ourselves, an organization dedicated to the remembrance of the Holocaust and all genocides. My friend connected me with Holocaust survivors in Massachusetts, some of whom were hidden children sent to children's homes, never to see their parents again. And I then went to France, and I met survivors there, and I visited the children's schools and chateaus that had been set up in Vichy, France during the war. And I traveled with the historian Pierre-Jerome Biscaret, who had been studying the fate of Jewish children in France for 17 years, and who located mass graves of Jews in Belarus, Poland, the Ukraine, and Russia. I also had the honor of traveling with Christian Montbrasson, a child survivor, and I returned with him for the first time to the village of Chambon, sur lignon a Huguenot town that rescued hundreds, perhaps even thousands of Jews. It was the first time he'd returned since he was a child sent away for his protection, and it was a very moving and emotional experience as we searched for the house of the family who had rescued him. 
As I wrote The World That We Knew, I realized so much of what had happened during the Holocaust was based on hatred and fear of the other and a reaction and hatred of refugees. I learned that hatred begins small and grows larger and larger, quietly and slowly, and that if we don't stop it, it will take over and it will be too late. For me, the only way to write about a time that was so illogical and so irrational was to approach it as though it were a dark fairy tale. The subject was so horrific that realistic fiction can't do it justice. To write about the psychology of the Holocaust in France and the plight of the missing is to enter into the realm of dreams and dark enchantments. Only then can we begin to understand what happened. That once upon a time, not so long ago, there were men who were beasts and beasts who were loyal and kind. There was hatred and fear that made no sense and children were lost in the woods. I am in awe of the survivors that I met who were children during the war and are now in their 80s and 90s. I needed to hear their stories and I needed to tell you a story that began once upon a time in a world where there seemed to be nothing but evil, but a story that ended with the fact that love could still be found. Thank you again so much. Pretty sure Alice Hoffman is my guardian angel because she's been hovering over my shoulder all weekend. Great speech. I'm continuing with fiction. I'm going to read from the citation written by the author Richard Bausch, who was a finalist judge and the 2009 winner of the Date Literary Peace Prize for his novel, Peace. We Germans is an intense, short novel with an enormous impact because it faces into the great unanswerable human conundrum, the persistence of evil, the very nature of it, and all the facets of helpless striving from which it can spring. A young British man has questioned his grandfather about what it was like being a German soldier in World War II. The grandfather, Meisner, refuses to talk about it, but after his death, a long letter is discovered in the effects, addressing to the young man, my dear Callum, it begins, and the story unfolds. One has the feeling, reading this book, that evil may be a sort of mental or spiritual strand of molecular structure in our nature. Meisner talks of the life as a common soldier of the Third Reich, recalling the horrors of the Eastern Front in Russia, and then in the Gulag as a prisoner of war. I wasn't a Nazi, he says. No court would find me guilty of anything, not even an omniscient one. What I want to tell you isn't about atrocities or genocide. I didn't see the camps, and I'm not qualified to say anything about them. I read Primo Levi's book about it, like everyone else. Except, of course, that when we Germans read it, we have to think we did this. He goes on to say that the letter is about courage, and gives us an example, the story of a brother who is terminally ill, playing football on his crutches. But as he goes on, describing the terrible winter of 1944, as the German army dissolves in starvation and hypothermia, and the attritions of combat, a portrait emerges of a man with blood on his hands, trying to explain to his grandson how it was, how it truly was. What one comes to reading this fine novel is a strange kind of revelation, how our great tragedy as a species may not be savagery, but a devastatingly two-edged facet of our being, our capacity for cooperation, for lining up and doing what is ordered, and the letter itself becomes what its fictional recipient calls a conflicted inheritance. This is a novel of great intelligence and eloquence, a fully realized portrait of the complex threads that make up a single life in terrible times. The New York Times wrote, Starr's daring work challenges us to lay bare our histories, to seek answers from the past, and to be open to perspectives starkly different from our own, while Kirkus Reviews called it a small masterpiece. Alexander Starr was born in the northeast of Scotland and educated at Oxford University, where he read modern languages and history at Somerville College. He's lived in Italy, where he worked for the Santa Maddalena Literary Foundation and in Germany. He now lives in London with his family. It's my pleasure to introduce this year's winner of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, Alexander Starrett.
Thank you. Um, it feels pretty great to be up here. Uh, I don't usually spend my time flying around the world to collect prizes and have people say nice things about me. Um, uh, actually, when I left university and decided to spend my time uh, writing rather than getting a real job, uh, I was quite worried about it. And I thought, I'll give myself a deadline of three years and if I haven't hit, if I haven't written a hit after three years, I'll go back to university and do something sensible. That deadline went past about 10 years ago. Uh, <laughs> I'm still plugging away. Uh, so thank you, it really feels good. Um, As for the book, I wrote it in large part because I live in a country, the UK, which is still fixated on the Second World War. Uh, the war has become part of the origin story for the modern country, uh, like Romulus and Remans for the Romans. Before the war, Britain's idea of itself was very different. It was a superpower. It had so many territories that the sun could never set on them all at the same time. And since the war, Britain has been a middling sort of a country. And the war has become the story of how that new country came into being and why it's a proud thing to be. The moment of genesis was when France had been overrun and Britain stood alone against Hitler, the embattled little island against the continental war machine. That's when a new idea of Britain was born. You still see it very clearly today. The newspapers talk about COVID in terms of the blitz spirit. And British people celebrate Christmas by watching war movies like The Dam Busters or The Great Escape on TV. The strange thing for me growing up was that, uh, as you heard yesterday, my mum and my beloved grandparents were German. Uh, my grandfather, my opa, fought in the Second World War on the German side. He wasn't a Nazi, but he was a soldier, and to put it polemically, he fought for Hitler. So when I watched these movies where the Germans were the baddies, I couldn't enjoy it in the same way as everybody else. And there was a certain cultural dissonance. And when I was a kid, there was a crude bowl and spoon on a shelf in my grandfather's house. He'd made the spoon from scrap wood when he was in the Russian prisoner of war camp and had eaten with it for three years. When I was at university or afterwards, he would say to me, when I was your age, I was in Russia. Don't forget how lucky you are. And the point I want to make here is about that sense of dissonance. How do you reconcile what you know about the war, about the Nazi regime, and about the Holocaust with the experiences of your own family? How do you explain that good, decent people like my grandfather fought for the Nazis? And where do you stand when you belong to a society that does abhorrent things? So that, as Gilbert said, you, you have to say, I didn't do this, but we did it. When you watch movies about that time, most of the characters are heroes or villains. But in reality, a small number were sadists and fanatics, and at the other end of the scale, a small number of people did heroic things. But what about the ordinary people who were neither? That's the question this book tries to tease apart. And that dissonance also came with a useful lesson. No country is ever quite as right as it thinks it is. British people, despite their war fixation, know next to nothing about Germany. They think it's all beer and sausages and the Mercedes factory, which is kind of half true, but n not quite what matters. Uh, and I should say the Germans are just as ignorant about Britain, which they think consists of the Queen, imperial nostalgia, and soccer hooligans. And most of the time, this stuff doesn't really matter. It's just countries misunderstanding each other in the same way that people do. Uh, but sometimes it matters a lot. Uh, today in Britain is actually Remembrance Sunday, the memorial for the First World War. And I ask myself whether that essentially pointless slaughter could have taken place 
if those young men from all over Europe and America had known a little bit more about each other. The thing we forget is that in 1914, war was hugely popular. People signed up very enthusiastically. Now, I think perhaps it would have been different if they'd spent years going on holiday to each other's countries, as we do now. I think it's naive to believe that with greater knowledge of each other, our conflicts and clannish impulses would simply dissolve. But the better we do know each other, the higher the bar that jingoists have to get over to convince us to handle our disputes with weaponry, rather than the time-honored tools of diplomacy, economic argy-bargy, and talking trash about each other. I also watched an interview with Tony Blair recently where he was asked what went so wrong for Britain and America in Iraq. Lots of things. But he said that when you really got down to it, the problem was that we just didn't understand the country. We didn't understand what the consequences would be if we removed Saddam, and the result was catastrophe. Or Afghanistan. The Germans were actually there too, uh, alongside the rest of NATO in their first overseas military deployment since 1945. We in the West had our own narrative of what was going on there. But what did the Afghans think? How did Afghan politics work? We were there for 20 years and we never really found out. So in the end, what we'd constructed fell apart practically overnight. I see the same thing happening again now with China. In the past few years, everybody has suddenly got a lot of very confident opinions about China and the Chinese and what's going on over there. And I think maybe this time, we should try finding out a little bit more about them. To do that, we need books. And that's why this prize is such a good idea. You may also know the prize comes with a lovely big check. Uh, many of you will have contributed to it. Uh, I've decided to use the money to help my old college at Oxford uh, provide an education to a refugee. They've had two refugee students so far. Thanks. Um, the first student they've had is a young woman from Libya who's studying medicine. Uh, the second is a teenager who arrived from Afghanistan four years ago with no formal education and little English as an unaccompanied minor. Uh, he's now won a place to read history and economics, and the money you've donated will allow the university to take on a third person of this type. So in the end, the prize you've created here in Dayton, in memory of the Dayton Accords, has not just made me very happy and contributed to the cause of international understanding, it will also give somebody from a war-ruined country the chance of a new life. Thank you. Well, we've been building and building to this moment, and, uh, but what a foundation so far. Gloria Steinem, 2015 Date Literary Peace Prize Ambassador Richard Holbrook Distinguished Achievement Award winner, is a writer, lecturer, political activist, and feminist organizer. She travels in this and other countries as an organizer and a lecturer, and is a frequent media spokesman, spokeswoman on issues of equality. She is particularly interested in the shared origins of sex been. and race caste systems, gender roles, and child abuse as roots of violence, nonviolent conflict resolution, the cultures of indigenous peoples, and organizing across boundaries for peace and justice. Her autobiography, On the Road, details her more than 30 years on the road as a feminist organizer. In 1972, she co-founded Ms. Magazine and remained one of its editors for 15 years. She continues to serve as a consulting editor for Miss and was instrumental in the magazine's move to join and be published by the Feminist Majority Foundation. In 1968, she had helped to found New York Magazine, where she was a political columnist and wrote feature articles. As a freelance writer, she was published in Esquire, New York Times Magazine, and Women's Magazines, as well as for publications in other countries. 
She has produced a documentary on child abuse for HBO, a feature film about the death penalty for Lifetime, and been the subject of profiles on Lifetime and Showtime. Joining us virtually to introduce this year's recipient of the Ambassador Richard Holbrook Distinguished Achievement Award is Gloria Steinem. I have the great honor of introducing Margaret Atwood. The only problem is that this is like saying describe the universe and give two examples. There is no way that I can do justice to the heart, soul, intellect, and imagination that Margaret Atwood has already shown us in her work with more to come. She is the author of writing published in more than 45 countries, and that includes more than 50 works of fiction, poetry, critical essays, and graphic novels. Now there is global anticipation for Dearly, her first collection of poetry in over a decade, and her latest novel, The Testament, is already co-nominated for the 2019 Booker Prize. She herself also makes possible good actions around the world, not only with her words and her imagination, but also with her personal support of Equality Now, the global women's rights organization. She is the friend and activist you would always have wanted on your side. And she is also a friend that you would definitely want on your side. She is the great and rare artist who not only you want to follow and read every word of, but also to hug, support, protect, and have lunch with. She is kind of the perfect person. Please welcome a woman whose words and imag imagination change the reality and politics and actions of our world. This is the one and only Margaret Atwood. I'm, I'm not the perfect person. <laughs> it's just letting you know. Oh uh, yes, if my family heard that, they would laugh their heads off. Americans are the best at tributes and celebrations of other people's work. Take it from me, I'm a connoisseur, you're the best. Uh, Canadians are not so good at this. <laughs> So my old friend E.L. Doctorow said to me, the Canadians didn't like my book. I said, they loved your book. He said, how could you tell? <laughs> so it is like that, you have to translate. So American best thing since sliced bread, most perfect person ever, oh, just you know, equal to God practically, uh, translates into Canadian. Not bad. <laughs> so thank you, Dayton Literary Awards team, you for this wonderful celebration of uh, people's work and of words and of word people. What can I tell you? Not bad. <laughs> but I'll I'll up that. I'll up that to the to the highest we can go, which is. Not bad at all, that's the, that's the best. <laughs> I am deeply honored by the company I am keeping, such generous, talented, and essential writers. And I'm so honored to be receiving this award, one that is especially meaningful in these times. I don't need to tell you that this is the most challenging period for democracies since the 1930s, a decade within which I was born and that culminated in World War II. Wars and civil wars are truly horrible. 
and they are often driven by quarrels over resources of many kinds. The climate crisis has already resu resulted in shortages and wars and civil wars and many refugees. Is the world finally paying attention, enough attention to the chaos the climate crisis is causing and will cause? I hope we don't find out the hard way. And to you here, please do not let your country be torn apart. This would not be a positive development, I say Canadianly. This award is named for Richard Holbrook, who occupied that most delicate of positions. He was a diplomat. Diplomacy is one of the hardest things that human beings do, but also one of the most necessary. It means sitting down with people you may consider to be thugs, butchers, and terrorists, while realizing that they may have the same opinion of you. It means listening to these people carefully, though listening does not always mean agreeing. Diplomacy is the art of the possible, and the impossible can be very limited. Pacts negotiated by diplomats never result in agreements that are perfect. All such agreements are flawed, and all have a best before date, and are subject to revisionism and or collapse, then of course the negotiators get blamed for not having done better. Such is diplomacy. It can be hazardous. More than one diplomat and pact maker has been executed by extremists or paranoid leaders on their own sides. Blessed be the peacemakers, says the Bible, for they will be called the children of God. Maybe so but they have also been called traitors, sellouts, fools, and cowards. But what are the alternatives to diplomacy and the resulting agreements, the always imperfect agreements? Yelling and name-calling, uttering death threats, opening fire on unarmed people, driving cars into groups of peaceful protesters, shooting folks in the back, these are not diplomacy. They are violent pressure tactics, and human beings have pursued these tactics for a long time as well. Human beings have also acted as agents provocateurs, pretending to be on one side and behaving extremely while all the time acting for the other side. Do I read too many spy novels? <laughs> possibly, but possibly not. We live in an age of secret identities, online especially. We also live in an age of the doctrine of unintended consequences. Remember when the World Wide Web first appeared? Wasn't it wonderful? We would be able to connect around the world, share our happy and hopeful ideas, and foster universal peace and prosperity. So how did we end up in a toxic stew of lies, hatred, fear, and life-destroying misinformation? Alas, any technology is only as worthy as the uses to which it is put. And any technology is not finally employed only by the well-meaning. Most discouraging of all, and contrary to popular belief, People are more easily manipulated through their good intentions than through their selfish and malevolent ones because most people really are trusting and well-meaning. We do so long to be good. But not everyone cares about being good. As democracies weaken at the seams, those hostile to them stir up hatred and promote confusion hoping to prepare the way for authoritarians and or widespread social collapse from which they themselves will profit. As a diplomat, how can you deal with bad faith? Ah, 
thereby hangs a tale, many tales. But that is enough gloom for today. Let us instead hope. Let us hope for a many-faceted and workable approach to the climate crisis, one that involves every group in society and that will benefit all. Let us hope for a resolution to the polarization in our society. Let us hope that democracy, always so far imperfect, never yet fully achieved, manages to keep itself afloat. Let us hope for more diplomats like Richard Holbrook because they are sorely needed. Sometimes people quote a line from one of my poems, a word after a word after a word is power, but they don't qualify that. What kind of words? What kind of power? Are they true words? And are they fair words? I repeat, let us hope. Thank you. Should have seen the notes in her margins. I mean, she literally came to the podium with a pen. That concludes the author's uh, remarks and awards for this evening. We're still not quite done yet. There's more. But at first, I just wanted to say um, uh, congratulations to Sharon and Nick and this entire Dayton Literary Peace Prize community for pulling this off. Obviously challenging, we're talking about two years. Um, I don't know how we did it. Obviously, Margaret may not be a perfect person. There's no award ceremony that's perfect, but this one was amazing. And uh, I just thank you all for really being patient, for sitting there in your mass and really storming through all this and coming out to support these writers. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a remarkable thing in this day and age, and, and we are grateful as writers to see so many people out here, so thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, here to close this wonderful evening under the direction of Do Dr. Carlos Brown with Everett M. Moore on piano, the Central State University Chorus. They will be singing Great Day, arranged by Moses Hogan and Janelle Ishmael, soprano, and Let There Be Peace on Earth, arranged by Mark Hayes. Ladies and gentlemen, Cent Central State Chorus.
can stand and join us tonight. Let it begin. 